Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, I feel deeply honored and grateful to be able to share this, this work and this research with you all. Um, it really means a lot and thank you, Will and Sarah. Um, just, I know we're all remote uh, and internet based here. I live um, just a handful of miles from the Canadian border in Northern Vermont. So I actually sneaked across the border so I can actually be in Canada uh, presenting to you all, which is which was a little, just a little more authentic. And um, Adam, that was great to see what you're up to. And one more reason for me to be frustrated with our current government and that it drove you away from our shores up north. But I look forward to some more international collaboration. All right, let's get on with the show. So this is, uh, I'm going to be speaking um, around, about the carbon impact of our built infrastructure um, and specifically looking at the relationship between the impact of the operational side of buildings and the embodied carbon of the materials that we build with and how to look at a broader context of uh, carbon understanding and management in our attempts to build buildings that not only reduce our uh, climate impact, but can actually work to uh, reverse some of that impact. Um, I wanted to call out um, Chris Magwood and Ace McCarlton, who I believe are both on the call as uh, my co-conspirators and collaborators in this presentation. So I'm presenting really work on behalf of the three of us as a presenting team. So I just wanted to um, give them um, laudations and credit for being part of this work. So let's start with some context. Now I'm aware that I am speaking to a, one of the most well-educated and technically versed audiences that I often have the, the privilege to speak to. So I'm gonna move through some of the context relatively quickly um, and also to keep respectful for all of our time. So if, you, if I move a little too fast, I know we're not in person and it's hard for you to catch my attention, but please feel free to throw questions into the question page. Um, I don't have a formal cutoff time, so even when I'm done, if folks want to stick around a little bit, I'll attempt to answer any questions I can this evening. If we run out of time, I'm happy to follow up after the fact, uh, for sure. Um, so what's very helpful in, in contextualizing this issue of the climate impact of our buildings is to, is to sort of put our buildings into the larger carbon cycle on our planet. And we'll get back to this, back to this piece, but really um, to, in a gross oversimplification, um, the carbon exists in a cyclical balance on our planet. And we have uh, an issue currently, which I believe we should all be aware of at this point, that we are loading too much uh, atmospheric carbon into the, the bathtub of our atmosphere, um, to use the metaphor represented in this image. Um, faster than the bathtub can be drained. And it's being filled, as we know, through um, a, a variety of different sources. No small part are human-derived um, activities, including burning of fuels um, to do everything from create building materials to keep buildings warm, um, and all the other things we do to load greenhouse gas emissions into our atmosphere. There are a series of different ways that in the cycle of carbon throughout our planet that that bathtub can get um, emptied, so to speak. Um, you can see in the bottom left-hand corner, <clears throat> there's a few different places that that can go. Some of that atmospheric carbon gets absorbed by plants. Um, some of it gets transferred into the soil. Some of it gets absorbed by the oceans and some of it gets sequestered geologically. <clears throat> and that carbon moves in a cyclic fashion across these different locations. And so I don't, we don't need to dwell too long on this, um, but I want us to hold that concept of a cycl cyclic movement of carbon throughout these different sort of storage vessels um, on our planet and in our atmosphere. And that's what we're really focused on for the context of this conversation is how to drain more of that bathtub, as more of the carbon out of that atmospheric bathtub um, into particularly plants and soil. We're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about that uh, because that is a, a key leverage point that we as builders can, can utilize in the selection of our materials. Um, so just hold this image. We're going to return back to this concept as we move forward through the presentation. Um, so <clears throat> I'm speaking to a group of passive house builders. You all are intimately aware of many of the minutia of operational energy in our buildings. And that's what really historically 
has been one of the, if not the largest source of our um, greenhouse gas emission emissions is from the operational use of our buildings, primarily through heating and cooling. Um, we're in a cold climate, so heating often takes, if not always takes the lion's share of that. Um, as passive house builders, we actually seal closer to a heating and cooling balance because our buildings are so thermally efficient. Um, and what's, again, putting this back into the context of a carbon cycle, um, just as there's a cycle of carbon throughout our atmosphere, into our their biosphere, our geosphere, our aquasphere, we also see a cycling of carbon that gets emitted throughout the uh, different phases of our of our building's lifespan. Um, so, you know, starting at the <clears throat> pardon me, starting at the uh, sort of one o'clock position, uh, when materials are extracted from the ground and processed and then brought into their manufacturing to turn into actual building materials, then transported onto a site, um, actually built in the process of building. Um, then there's the operational use of that building, heating, cooling, plug loads, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the refurbishment and reuse maintenance of buildings follows that. There's demolition um, and the, the decommissioning of our buildings. And then there's the recycling or the disposal of those materials. Um, every single part of that phase has a potential carbon emission impact. And we have, again, spent a very long time looking at energy efficient from a climate standpoint, been focusing a lot specifically on the operational phase of our buildings and specifically uh, within that on the energy consumption uh, of, our, of our buildings for, again, heating and cooling and lighting, et cetera, as that energy profile comes with a pretty significant carbon impact. Um, what is our challenge right now <clears throat> is to expand our focus on really throughout this entire carbon cycle, where are we creating emissions? At what time frame are those emissions released? And what is the quantity of those emissions throughout this entire cycle? Um, and what we are realizing more and more as we look at this closer and closer is that this early phase of a building's life cycle when our materials are extracted, processed, and produced um, not only holds a very significant amount of carbon impact from our building's life cycle, but the time frame of that impact is all the more relevant due to the, the urgency of action that we, that we need to take to be able to stabilize um, atmospheric carbon levels to keep the bathtub from overflowing, to refer back to that metaphor. So for the purposes of this conversation, <clears throat> when I'm referring to embodied carbon, I'm going to introduce that term for the first time. For those of you that aren't familiar with that term, we are referring to the <clears throat> carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide equivalents. So when I say carbon, I'm using very shorthand language to explain <clears throat> the carbon dioxide equivalent emissions. And what that means is carbon dioxide is not the only greenhouse gas that is emitted through this carbon life cycle of a building, um, methane, a host of different um, coolants and refrigerants all have very significant um, greenhouse gas profiles to them. But to be able to compare all these together, we make them equivalent to their, their greenhouse gas effect of a molecule of carbon dioxide. So for example, um, methane is commonly accepted to have an equivalent of 25 carbon dioxide molecules. So if we we're looking at the embodied carbon of the materials that exist within this sort of highlighted phase, we're looking at the emissions of carbon dioxide and all of these other associated greenhouse gas affecting chemicals that and, and making their equivalent value as if they were carbon dioxide. So when I say carbon, I'm not talking about the molecule carbon. I'm talking about <clears throat> the equivalence of greenhouse gas emissions to carbon dioxide. And so, again, the phase that I'm mostly referring to at this point is the cradle to gate phase. And so that is from the time um, uh, of raw materials extracted from the ground and processed and turned into a building material and leaves the quote unquote factory gate. That is, for the most part, the phase of the building's life cycle that I'm referring to when we talk about embodied carbon. That is not to say that there are not other boundaries of time that we can be evaluating. It's very common to look at, <clears throat> for example, in life cycle analysis, looking at the entire life cycle of a building all the way around that wheel and looking at the cumulative carbon emissions. That is another totally valid uh, quantification of embodied carbon to evaluate. 
right now we're talking about basically what happens in our materials before we use them and what's that impact. So that's the boundary condition that we're setting for the purposes of this conversation when I describe embodied carbon. Oops. So one of the biggest issues to explore here is the time value of carbon emissions. So if, uh, if what we know from the reports that came out from the IPCC, uh, International Panel on Climate Change, in I believe September, and it was shortly followed um, in the US by our government's release of its three-year um, cyclic climate report, is that we have a very short window of time to enact very significant reductions of atmospheric carbon lowering. We really have to turn the faucet off on that bathtub very quickly. And so when we're looking at the embodied carbon or the just the overall carbon emissions of the building's life cycle, that puts a very different benchmark of when we have to realize emission reductions than what we may have classically been thinking about. So for example, if you're looking at energy efficiency measures to reduce the carbon impact of heating energy, um, if you're looking at that over a 70-year life cycle of a building, that means that those reductions are realized essentially on an annual basis every heating season over the course of the lifespan of that building. I'm just throwing out 70 as a number. Um, but if what we know is that we have a very narrow window of time, um, in this graph, we're looking at 2050, with the release of these reports, arguably that um, dotted vertical line that marks that 2050 time period should be moved pretty far to the left. Uh, that means that we don't have the luxury of, of uh, elongated and um, gradually and incrementally realized carbon savings. We need to save that carbon immediately. We really needed to save it 20 or 30 years ago. Um, but when we look at the time frame across that cycle of carbon emissions from a building, when those carbon emissions are, are released, um, it is uh, very heavily front loaded through the material production and construction phases of the building. And so this puts an extra special weight and value on the importance of addressing the carbon emissions of material manufacturing because that is the that is the carbon that has been released before the building has even been occupied and that's why i'm i'm kind of calling out that specific boundary condition yes it does matter if there are materials um say refrigerants that have a risk of being released and being a contributing factor to greenhouse gas emissions near the end of the building's life but if we're expecting that that's not going to happen for another 40 50 60 70 years we don't have the luxury of worrying about what's going to happen 80 years from now. We have to have an immediate response towards our building's climate impact. And the, one of the greatest leverage points we have in reducing our short term emissions profile is in everything that happens within this very, very first phase of a building's lifespan. And that uh, potential exists within looking at our materials profile. So I'm going to be speaking a lot about materials because of their incredible weight and value based on the short time frame we have to turn the faucet off on that bathtub. So a lot of what I'm going to show you um, is a, a, a research work in, that's done primarily through modeling that um, Chris and Ace and I have been working on over the last year. Um, Chris in particular has done a very deep dive um, through both his professional practice and his uh, work on a, on a, in a master's program to really look at the embodied carbon of building materials. And Ace and I, through our work with our company, New Frameworks, um, have been working a lot on the practical um, implementation of these materials into real world market driven product projects. Um, so what we're going to show you right now is modeled research. Um, we have been working on retooling a lot of this data, um, both with information we've learned over the last year, as well as more um, uh, sort of real life developed case studies that we'll be presenting over the course of the year to come in 2019. So if this information strikes you, strikes your fancy, you know that there is a lot more um, that we are working on to, to present in the years to come. So to the, in the year to come. So to, to give context to what you're about to look at, we took a, a thousand square foot small residence. Uh, we fixed that footprint. So any of the changes we're gonna have in materials, in envelope profiles, et cetera, et cetera, are all still based around a thousand square foot of livable space. 
Um, and we crunched a lot of data about the different carbon, embodied carbon profiles of different materials it took to build a couple of different types of houses to try to get a better sense of really what does this look like? What are the what are these different materials look like from from a climate impact standpoint, and how does that relate to their operational performance? Um, a lot of the data, most of the data we used came from environmental product declarations. Uh, which are data sheets uh, reported by third party verified and reported by either industry or manufacturers for specific products. Um, and in some cases where that wasn't available, we referred to the inventory of carbon and energy. Um, so to look a little more at EPDs, um, and it's basically a um, uh, an environmental scorecard, if you will, that looks at various different types of impacts from various materials. Um, the one that we're most interested in for the purposes of our conversation is the greenhouse gas uh, emissions of a given material or category of materials. Now, we could spend hours talking about the, you know, the validation of this data, the ability or, or difficulty in comparing this data. There is a lot to dig into, and we do not have time for that in this conversation. Uh, suffice to say, that is one of the pieces that um, not only we as a research team, but we, the larger we of an industry looking at embodied carbon data is really wrangling with right now how to get good comparable data and verified data. So I'm going to encourage us as we look through this information, know that this is where most of our sourcing is coming from, but I don't want anyone to have the illusion that these are super well vetted, you know, down to the second decimal points, you know, precise calculations of carbon. We're looking at larger patterns here. So, and I can talk more about that and about the, the uh, sourcing of this data uh, after the presentation for those that are interested. I recognize I'm speaking to a passive house crowd, so I expect there will be some of those questions and I invite those. So looking at, we started from just taking uh, basically two profiles of a building. Um, one that was, you know, maybe on the higher carbon side, but still of a pretty normal, when I say carbon, higher carbon, again, higher embodied carbon material uh, side of things that we would still legitimately expect to see. And that's what we see on the left here. Um, you'll note that a lot of that is packed into the, into the, when I say HDSS, so that's high density spray foam uh, insulation. Now that number uh, that we used uh, is a relatively high number. It does not reflect the lowest possible um, uh, blowing agent profile of spray foams. This is an industry average number. Um, it, there's also some questioning around the, again, when I was talking about the, the boundary um, uh, conditions of looking at materials, the spray foam is very hard to break apart just from when it leaves the factory. When it leaves the factory, it's in two individual um, drums of chemicals that actually get mixed on site. And so there is a little bit of an uh, aberration there as well. But the patterns stand up and these are, you know, essentially what we're looking at, give or take, you know, a multiplier of the, the, the loading in building A on the left that is using pretty high embodied carbon materials and then building B on the right, again, a fixed footprint. And so the, the, the usable size of the building has not changed at all. The performance values of the enclosure are all exactly the same, but we're favoring specifically very low, low, low embodied materials and designing with the embodied carbon of material impact in mind. So this, we just sort of started with this to take a look and we're like, whoa, okay, there's a really huge scale here. Um, and this is where we started moving a little bit further into um, our exploration here. Now, there are a lot of different product categories. For those of you that um, are familiar with the, the CSI divisions of materials for, for your estimating or project management uh, approach, there are a, a series of different divisions that hold a whole lot of of uh, embodied carbon, um, steel, uh, concrete, a lot of the uh, structural components become really big players. For the purposes of our, our study and what we're gonna be primarily presenting on today is looking at insulation. And we're really interested in that for a couple of reasons. One, in that we're building relatively small buildings uh, as we're looking in the residential scale uh, for the purposes of this conversation. And so there, there tends to be less pressure on high carbon intensive structural systems as you would find in multi-story buildings and larger buildings. But two, we're really interested in this, this, this dilemma of using high embodied carbon materials to try to reduce 
the operational carbon impact of our buildings. And that conundrum um, really hits very close to home. When we look at the incorporation, looking at this graph here, we're looking at a series of different materials, of insulation materials, all normalized to a, a pretty standard R value. Um, there is a very, very large span of, of embodied carbon impact, all to achieve the same effective R value and to reduce the same amount of operational energy usage. Uh, and this seemed like something we really needed to expose because we were concerned that a lot of builders are, are actually in an, in an honest attempt to be part of the solution are actually front loading a significant uh, amount of carbon into the, the first phase of their building, which is the time where we need to be saving it the most. So just to explain what you're seeing a little bit in the graph here, <clears throat> again, the, the entire um, uh, sort of vertical span of, um, of the life cycle of the materials at the bottom, again, we're looking at material extraction through manufacturing, so just those numbers one and two, and all of the yellow bars to the right are showing the net emissions of carbon. All of the, the blue or blue-green, depending on the, the color tone of your monitor, to the left are showing materials that have a legitimate um, storing of carbon through that first phase of life cycle. <clears throat> now, there's a lot to be unpacked about the carbon storage potential of materials, but essentially, when we were, again, that first picture, when we were looking at the bathtub, the drain in that bathtub, some of that atmospheric carbon goes into, this, into rocks, some of it goes into the ocean. A lot of it gets um, photosynthesized by plants and stored in the body of that plant or um, pushed down into the soil. And so when we're looking at um, biogenic, biological material, biologically based materials that are carboniferous in their nature, we realize a very strong potential by taking advantage of the carbon cycle of our planet to intervene in that cycle and grab that carbon after it's been sucked out of the atmosphere, bound into plant bodies, and then using that stored carbon um, as an effective insulation uh, or other form of building material uh, in, our, in our structures. And that um, type of not just the approach there in which we're not just looking to minimize our impact, but actively reduce atmospheric carbon loading for us is the most thrilling and exciting and motivating uh, vision of how we can intervene. Because what we know is that just getting to zero is, is wholly inadequate to address the atmosphere carbon reductions that the scientific com community is telling us we need to reach. We have to actually reduce that impact. And we have an opportunity here by partnering with natural ecological cycles of atmosphere carbon cycling into plant bodies to use those plants more actively and intentionally in our buildings. So that's essentially the thesis of what we're discussing here. So what do we do with that? Um, this was a first pass at trying to wrap our heads around the relationship between different levels of building and closure performance, the materials used to realize that performance, and the resulting um, operational carbon impacts from those different buildings um, under a couple of different mechanical systems. So just to give a quick, and we're not going to get super deep into this because we don't have the time, but I'm going to just describe what's happening here so you can go back and review this when you have a bit more time or ask some questions as you like. So what we're looking at here is these seven different scenarios. The first, the baseline scenario is a code minimum building um, built of sort of very conventional materials. Scenario two is a net zero building, a very high performance building using a lot of high embodied carbon um, uh, uh, insulation materials like XPS foam, closed cell spray foam. Scenario three is a, a building using uh, natural and very low carbon carbon storing materials um, built to the same high performance standard um, using a, a high efficiency natural gas heating system. Scenario four <clears throat> is looking at that Code, oh, and that, that same gas system is also uh, uh, employed in scenarios one and two. Uh, in scenario four, we take that same code minimum building, and then we look at its total carbon output if it was switched to air source heat pumps in an all electric powered building. Scenario five is like scenario two, but instead of gas, we're using air source heat pumps. Scenario six is our best case scenario. It's the super low um, enclosure that we had, low carbon enclosure that we have in scenario three, but now on an all electric 
um, uh, heating system. And scenario seven is if, so we recognize that not every builder tomorrow is going to be able to build uh, effectively market ready, ultra low carbon storing materials like straw or hemp. Um, so we looked at, okay, what are the lowest carbon emitting and carbon storing materials that you can readily purchase on the marketplace and build it today. They're in common practice. So this is essentially the market ready, uh, low carbon profile building. Um, we looked at a couple of different performance levels. Um, this series of numbers, um, the, the three, three, 10, 20, 24, 38, that's an ACH 50 of three. That is a window R value of three divide, you know, one by that number to get your U value. That is the uh, below uh, grade wall R value of 10, above grade R value of 20. Box number one, top left corner. Thank what you. He's referring to. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. Below a slab insulation level of R10, uh, foundation below grade wall va R value of 20, above grade R value of 24, and attic R value of 38. Um, so the, the coding there is ACH 50 sub slab foundation wall above grade, uh, sorry, window slab foundation wall above grade wall ceiling. If you want to play along at home, um, again, looking at the different material types, standard materials, high embodied carbon, high performance and low embodied carbon, um, high performance, looking at the gold, red and blue color coding, and then looking at these two different categories scenarios one through three of heating systems. This is a 95% efficient condensing natural gas boiler. Um, we're looking at an all electric air source mini split heat pump with an average COP of 2.5. Um, I should say for the sake of context um, that we only looked at for in the in operational carbon, we were only looking at heating, um, heating impacts. Um, we have since been working with remodeling total building energy and total operational um, uh, energy profiles using hourly dynamic modeling. So that will be forthcoming the next round of analysis. But just so you all know right now, when we talk about operational carbon uh, emissions for the sake of this study, we're just looking at heating because we're most interested in this relationship between the embodied carbon of insulation and the resulting um, heating impact. Okay, that's the context. Um, let's look at some comparisons. So looking at this graph, uh, you'll see the x-axis is looking at um, years and two-year increments. Um, and then the y-axis is looking at the um, embodied carbon equivalent emissions in tons. And we see this first gold bar um, that is the embodied carbon emissions of the everything that went into those materials to build that building. So every building enters its useful life for, for the occupants with this embodied carbon profile by virtue of its materials. And again, we're only looking at cradle to gate, so we're not looking at the impacts of transporting to site or the actual construction phase. That's not part of this analysis. And then we looked at, okay, well, what's the operational carbon emitted by that building for that heating system and fuel type um, you know, on an average annual basis? And so what we see for the code minimum building working on a high efficiency natural gas boiler, it, it starts its life with um, about 21 tons of embodied carbon, adds about two tons per year natural gas heating energy or heating carbon emissions. And we get by the time we hit to 2050, um, and that is, we're using that number because prior to the release of these fall reports was the um, goal established uh, by, generally accepted by the International Building Committee, uh, building uh, community uh, as the target for needing to reach zero carbon emissions by 2050 to hit the previously established benchmarks by the IPCC. Now we know that 2050 is actually going to be much sooner. We're now looking at 2025, 2030. Um, so again, bear that in mind as you're looking at these graphs. We have not had a chance to update that for these revised uh, reports. So if we compare that to the net zero high embodied carbon building, um, we're looking at, and you know, net zero being, you know, somewhat in air quotes here, so high performance. Um, we see an enormously, you know, a very significant uh, increase in the embodied carbon profile using more 
of higher embodied carbon materials. And we're now moving, say, from a five and a half inch, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm in the U.S. brain. I'm, I'm <laughs> imperial minded here. I'm not very good at quick metric conversions. No, we're, we're interested. Okay, you're interested too. Okay, great. So, you know, instead of a two by six fiber wall fiberglass bat, now we're looking at, you know, a significant amount, uh, double the R value in closed cell spray foam, as an example. Um, huge front loading of carbon. And while the um, overall emissions profile is you know, less than half, um, we're still seeing a significant increase in the total emissions by, by 2050. This was incredibly alarming to us. Um, now, granted, there are very large margins of error around, around these values, particularly in the embodied carbon side. But even with that, the fact that there is a, an analysis that could point towards a high performance building actually being worse in the short term carbon emission standards or, or, or goals for a building than a code minimum building was very alarming to us. So then we looked at, okay, how does that vet out against a ultra low carbon emitting carbon storing building uh, with the same enclosure profile and the sa same um, operational inputs um, through that gas heater. Um, and you can see we're at about, you know, around 18 tons by 2050. Um, there it is. Um, things change a bit when we switch the operational um, loading, uh, or the operation, sorry, when we switch the heating fuel source from a higher carbon emitting source like natural gas to a significantly lower emitting source like uh, a heat pump powered by electricity. Now I recognize there's an, a whole other presentation and conversation that we can trigger around the carbon mapping of different fuel sources. Um, I actually consider the, the natural gas emissions that I'm showing to be dramatically undervalued because they are not counting the methane emissions released during leakages and inefficiencies in the manufacturing and transportation of natural gas. There is also, um, you know, we're using Ontario carbon values for the carbon impact of the electrical grid in Ontario. These numbers change depending on where you are. If you're in the southeastern United States, um, where it's largely or, or a much larger mix of coal in the electric fuel grid, uh, then obviously those numbers are going to go up. So there's a whole other post of variables here. Um, but working with these baselines, we see as we get towards true zero carbon um, operational emissions, all of that carbon value lies within the materials. And so of course, that would make sense. We've zeroed this part of the phase out. It's all going to exist someplace else, but it also just shows by scale how much of that carbon is being invested up front and front loading carbon into our building in this attempt to reduce the operational val the operational emissions over this longer period of time. And this is this is another uh, another look at that as we decarbonize the fuel source of our buildings that puts even more pressure and even more focus on the on the the role and value of the carbon emissions of our materials but we don't we are under no illusion that zero is some sort of uh, you know appropriate goal to be able if the goal is truly to keep our our atmospheric bathtub for overflowing um, we not only have an opportunity, but a responsibility as a building industry to see how we can reverse that trend. And this is, again, where plants become some of our greatest allies. So when we look at the potential carbon storage of materials that are used to save operational carbon impacts like insulation, um, we start to see buildings that can show up as being net stores of carbon within, within this short term period of time. Um, and this is where I feel our greatest potential as a building industry lies. Um, now that we have gotten as good as we have on addressing the energy profiles of our buildings, we can turn all of our brilliance um, and leverage all of our, our might to open our arms to incorporate the potential for materials to be part of the solution as well. Um, and this, this comparison graph really um, speaks a lot to me as we look at um, a low, super low embodied carbon um, uh, building, we're looking at, you know, the best case scenario, um, up number six, when that building is run by a heat pump, 
we're, we're getting towards a, a legitimate calculation of, of carbon storage. And again, there is yet another presentation that exists within this of looking at how do you really qualify materials as being legitimate carbon storers. And there is a lot of, uh, there's a lot of discussion there. This really comes down to knowing the source of your materials. Um, and a tree that is harvested uh, from an FSC certified local woodlot um, with a validated chain of custody and an appropriate forest management plan um, is really different than the equivalent stud that is clear cut from a genetically engineered plantation, silviculture industrial system on the other side of a continent and, and transported you know, thousands and thousands of miles. So not only does the materiality matter, the all the way back to the source of that raw material extraction of those materials really matters as well. So that's what, you know, when I talk about materials, I'm not just talking about engaging with that material at the store counter. I'm talking about sourcing that material all the way back to its relationship in the ecological cycle. Um, and then looking below, this is the one actually that gets, that gets me every bit as excited as, as the upper graph. This is, again, looking at um, market ready. We're building with this today. Anyone can get this from basically any building supplier types of materials. So we're using wood fiberboard. We're using cellulose insulation. We're using responsibly managed uh, and sourced um, wood products. Um, we're, you know, those are the types of decisions. And we're talking about wood siding instead of cement composite siding. Some of those basic decisions. Um, we're seeing that we can, you know, give or take a margin of error, essentially get to a true net zero carbon building, even one that's on natural gas using a high efficiency boiler um, within this target period of time. Um, and that to me says we don't need to obsess over getting an entire legion of straw bale builders trained up and deployed across North America tomorrow. These are real changes that can be made immediately and quite simply um, to be able to realize very significant and perhaps most importantly, very timely reductions of the embodied carbon profiles of our buildings. And so when we look this at, up at this at scale, you know, it's funny, we, we uh, you know, Chris and I were in a, uh, and Ace and I were all in this meeting not too long ago where we're looking, this group of um, sort of green architects and engineers um, looking at the whole embodied carbon problem and or issue and how to deal with it. Um, and a lot of these folks were talking about the restrictions around large buildings and code restrictions and deployment issues and urban environments. And Chris made the point that, you know what, who's generally not represented at those meetings are builders of small buildings. Yet the still the significant, if not the majority, I don't have that number right in my head, but um, you know, a very, very large portion of the square footage that's built every year is still in small residential construction. And there is a tremendous amount of opportunity in the hands of builders as well as designers to be able to make some of those material selection decisions. Um, and this just points at a gravity of scale that can be realized um, rather than um, uh, worrying that we can only address this by looking at very large buildings, we can also address this by looking at the multitude of small buildings that are being built every every single year. Okay, now, I'm going to go through this quite quickly because it's late and I want to, again, be respectful of folks' time and we can circle back in questions for um, uh, as people have questions, but I did want to at least go through a quick profile of different material categories that we can, again, leverage quite quickly. And they kind of range from the off the shelf ready, like we saw in that sort of um, that last scenario, scenario seven of the sort of like carbon optimized market ready profile, all the way to the most like advanced and developing and innovative technologies that you'll start to see more and more of, or that the more, um, you know, adventurous of you can start sourcing out for your projects. Um, so yeah, rather than read this list, we'll just we'll just go right into them. So in the first category of insulation, wood fiberboard sheathing. Um, we've started using this um, pretty regularly on our projects, um, and it, it, there are a number of different manufacturers. Um, they create a, a number of different profiles for a number of different applications. Some are structural, some are not. 
Some are pretty thin and designed to replace, say, plywood or structural sheathing. Some are non-structural and very thick that are designed to use uh, as an exterior board sheathing application. Uh, we are in the kind of wrap-up stages of a, a three-unit passive house in Burlington, Vermont, that uses um, a single six-inch or six-and-a-quarter-inch um, panel of the same, what's shown here is a specific uh, product, uh, the manufacturer's Gutex, um, a single six inch thick layer tongue and groove product um, that is fantastic for anyone that has had the um, opportunity to build with mineral board and knows how itchy that is, uh, to build with foam board and have to deal with the site maintenance requirements of a thousand statically charged beads of foam sprayed all over the site. Um, this is an absolute dream product to work with. Um, and again, something you can pick up uh, from a supplier uh, in real time. We're building with this today. Um, Silas insulation. There's another one. Um, that it's been used for a long time. Best common practices are established. There is a whole host of benefits to this material. They're not all created equally. Um, so there is always, you know, details and translation there. But um, suffice to say, um, most of these products use an incredibly high recycled co uh, material content. Um, and that is all carbon in the material that is now bound for long-term service life in the walls of the building. Uh, we have been building with straw uh, in our cold, wet region um, for, oh gosh, um, going on 20 years. And there's a track record of, oh, 30, 40 years in this region. Um, and I feel completely committed to, to this as part of the material palette for uh, the 21st century cold climate builder. Um, we can speak a whole lot about this at length to anyone that is interested around the spe specific detailing. Um, one of the most exciting things about straw, and by straw, I'm actually going to open this up a little bit and include waste agricultural or agricultural byproduct uh, fibers as a general category. Um, because of the short cycle nature of this crop, as opposed to wood, which takes decades to realize its full useful growth potential, um, straw has the ability and short cycle, like annual cycle agricultural products, um, uptake a significant amount of, ag of atmospheric carbon very quickly. Um, and again, recognizing that time is of the utmost essence, it is intervening in an ecological carbon cycle with materials that operate in that short cycle uh, that gives us a tremendous opportunity as, as builders. And most of us are used to thinking, or those of us that have not been building a lot with straw tend to think of, um, you know, sort of lumpy adobe looking um, exterior plastered kind of desert Southwest United States style buildings, um, which is legitimate. That was a lot of the early architectural development of that material came from that tradition. However, um, looking at the left, this is a building that uh, Chris Magwood, um, was involved with, and Chris has done a lot of North American pioneering work on um, prefabricated straw panels. There are companies across the world, a number of them in, in Europe, um, in uh, Australia, on uh, other corners of the planet, that have been using prefabricated panels um, using agricultural fiber as the insulation material. Um, so do not be under some illusion that you're locking yourself into a rigid architectural style by choosing to, to work with agricultural fibers for insulation. Uh, we are just beginning to unpack the potential of this material in a host of different architectural and development contexts. Um, hempcrete uh, kind of follows a similar theory from a, from a carbon, a similar pattern from a carbon uh, standpoint and the, the ecological relationship of plants and atmospheric carbon uptake. Um, but it's a little bit different in that this material is also bound with a, um, a bit of binder, um, often lime, uh, though other binders have been used as well. And so it offers a, a series of different application potentials as a spray in or prefabricated blocks. Uh, please don't mistake the, the suffix crete um, to expect that this is actually a concrete replacement. It is not. 
Um, this is purely a non-structural infill or self-supporting precast insulation material. Um, and there is a lot of exciting potential as we see, certainly in the US, we're seeing the hemp industry um, on the verge of a resurgence um, now that there is what appears to be bipartisan support of, um, of moving hemp into sort of bringing it in from the cold into the U.S. agricultural um, market. Um, I expect there's probably similar moves um, already in, right ahead of us um, here in Canada, and there's a lot of potential there for us. Um, this is a really cool and exciting product. Um, mushroom foam, if you will. There's a company, Ecovative Design, has been um, uh, developing a series of different um, mycelium-based insulation products. Um, and most of what they have is market ready right now or for the packing industry. So they are growing mushrooms, uh, proprietary um, organism uh, that they're formulating into uh, packaging materials. Um, but we have been working with a series of their different board products um, for a couple of years now. They're not off the shelf market ready. So this is one of the falls more into the category of innovative and up and coming materials. Um, however, we, uh, one of the things our company does is build um, foam free, um, high performance uh, doors using native Vermont lumber um, and non foam based insulation. Um, and we have built a series of doors using these mycelial mycelium insulation panels as the insulation um, and are very happy with the results. Um, and then paints and washes and stains. There's a lot of potential here. Now this gets, as we're looking at mineral based finishes, we move a, a bit away from the carbon storing potential. Um, but when you look at the, particularly the titanium dioxide um, um, uh, pigment that exists in most paints, uh, which has a very high embodied carbon profile by virtue of its processing, uh, we see an opportunity to use gallons and gallons and gallons of material at a much, much, much uh, lower embodied carbon profile. We also get the benefit of a much, much, much healthier product than most conventional paints. Um, so one thing that we're, we're not really gonna talk about, uh, we don't have time, um, but this particular product category highlights is there is a lot of overlap between low carbon and carbon storing materials and low toxicity and, and non-toxic building materials. And the overlay of those two um, sort of category, uh, sort of, you know, uh, profiles, values and, and materials is, an, is yet another opportunity for those of you that are really concerned about um, health and safety of builders and occupants and those that live up and downstream from um, manufacturers. Um, another category to look at is flooring. My gosh, especially if we were looking um, at the um, you know vinyl composite tile as a as a baseline, there's a plenty of room for improvement. Um, so starting from uh, earth as a as a very low low carbon uh, material that can be leveraged um, up to cork which is yet another example of a biogenic carbon storing uh, material. And cork in particular really excites me. Now, I recognize that there is a transportation impact in that the vast majority of cork that is produced commercially is from the Iberian Peninsula in Europe. So yes, we would have to legitimately value the transportation carbon impact to look at that material. But one, one great model that cork offers for us in the forested North American um, uh, regions, particularly those of us on the east and west coasts of the, of the continent, um, is that cork is a material that the more we can use that material and support that industry, there's actually a net increase of forested ecosystem that is kept maintained as productive ecosystem to support uh, to you know support that use. And so I, what I mean by that is um, the essentially the more people that use those products, the more of a market there is for those products. The more land can be kept in forested use and saved from the greatest competition, which is generally development, which now starts to poke at one of the most critical pieces is putting our building industry in context of agricultural and silvicultural industries and looking at working landscapes and, and a larger impacts beyond just the selection of a material. 
um, but that the potential that material selection has to influence other industries and allied industries and their goals around carbon reduction. I'm going to talk more about that a little bit later. Um, and clay and lime plasters, this sort of falls into a, a comparable category uh, as paints and finishes from the aesthetic standpoint. However, uh, we have a, a tradition of using clay and lime plasters not just as veneer, but as a as a quasi structural component, uh, as a, the primary and secondary air barriers, critical elements within our, our moisture control strategy, and essentially, you know, fundamental. Um, you know, critical layers of, of our building assembly, particularly our wall assemblies. And so at that point, we're now looking at displacing drywall, we're looking at displacing plastic membranes, um, and we've had tremendous success uh, effectively using plasters in those contexts. Um, now, it can be argued that that's a bit of a harder reach in colds and wet climates for exterior detailing. Um, I consider plaster to be one of the most superior air barrier service layers, particularly in interior air barrier strategies, uh, because of its flexibility and application, its durability and rigidity, its inspectability, its ease of maintenance. Um, I could go on. Um, but there's a strong role for plaster in our sort of uh, toolkit of carbon materials, low carbon materials. All right, looking at structure. If we are using, uh, if we're in the world of um, single family resident residential construction, majority of that is still wood framed. And now this gets, so we may take wood structure for granted in that context. I would say we should not take the sourcing of our wood for granted. And this is where, again, we don't have time in this conversation, but we could certainly get into a long conversation around the sourcing of that wood as being a critical part of this conversation. However, what's very exciting for those of us that are working in multi-story, um, medium and large buildings, the opportunity to offset um, structural steel and concrete with more and more wood elements. Um, and just being able to intervene in that category of, um, of building products uh, is yet another opportunity to work with the product categories that have some of the largest embodied carbon profiles of our buildings. Uh, again, we're not going to get too far down this line for this conversation, but there's a lot more to, to explore there for those of you working with larger structures. Um, that said, it's really hard to avoid the use of concrete in our built environment. What we know is that concrete is has it within within uh, the product category divisions is one of the largest offenders from uh, from the embodied carbon standpoint. And it's not necessarily it's because of the Portland cement content of concrete, and it's not necessarily that Portland cement has some really hard, high carbon profile. It's not at all like the blowing agents you see in conventional spray foams or in refrigerants, but it's just the dramatic uh, volume of concrete consumption that we as a building industry uh, yeah, use. And so to that end, we have a, we can really make a big impact in the embodied carbon and concrete just by virtue of the scale. And there's a really, there's a, another whole, whole deep dive into concrete that we could go into um, that looks, it's actually more of a multi-pronged strategy. Um, one is to just engineer our buildings better so that we're not just throwing more cheap concrete in this situation to save on engineering costs. If we stop overbuilding every single foundation because we don't want to go through engineering, uh, then we could dramatically cut down the embodied carbon profiles. Um, especially those of us in residential that often don't have the design budgets to support custom structural engineering, um, this could be a really strong leverage point for us. Um, within that, we could also tune down the strength profiles of our concrete. We don't necessarily need full PSI strength um, you know, veneer slabs. That's just not necessary. We could dial down the amount of cement that we use in that mix. Within that, we can use various additives um, to reduce the amount of, um, of Portland cements. Fly ash is a common one. There's various other pozzolans and supplementary cementitious materials that can be mixed in. And those are, those are ready. Those you can call your local ready mix plant and spec a mix. And there's online tools that can help guide you towards appropriate mix developments. Um, that's ready to go and already a, a, a tool is being used. And then there's some more of the advanced and um, up and coming and innovative technologies like carbon cure, carbocrete, which use atmospheric carbon 
um, as a curing agent and sequester that carbon into the cement or into the concrete while also offsetting the Portland cement con um, uh, uh, levels quotient. And so that, again, gets towards that regenerative, not just getting to zero, but actually pulling carbon out of the atmosphere. Another is this very exciting company, Biomason, that is working with um, aquatic organisms that uh, that take the carbon dioxide that is uh, within the, the, you know, the aquasphere and oceans uh, and converting that through their metabolic process into calcium carbonate. Um, so these little creatures actually poop bricks um, and gives us a, yet another model. Again, these regenerative models of not just reducing to zero, but actively intervening in ecological cycles to leverage carbon drawdown in building materials. Um, and then there's a host of different um, uh, sort of up and coming recycling based products. Now this may be looking at sort of that end of life um, phase for some materials, but it's actually looking at the very, very, very beginning of life for our building materials. Um, and so uh, one great example um, is Rewall. This is one that uh, Chris has worked with a bit um, and is again, as a, as a replacement for Virgin mine gypsum um, wallboard panels um, has a, a whole lot of uh, potential. Again, um, given the um, you know dramatic amount of square footage of wallboard that is put up across North America every year, um, we have an opportunity instead of using virgin or even recycled gypsum to be using an active waste product like beverage containers to create those those panels. All right, I thank you for bearing with me. This is, uh, I know, a lot of information. I'm going to kind of wrap us up here um, now that we're sort of getting in towards the, you know, I want to bring this back into context and kind of like looking forward now that we've kind of looked at a series of different technologies here. Um, I think really what I would like to, to present to you here is not just uh, a series of different technologies that we can engage with to get to zero. I really, really want to reinforce um, the pattern of uh, engaging in the carbon cycle within our ecologies intentionally and effectively as designers to really work with those carbon cycles to be able to effectively draw down atmospheric carbon dioxide. Um, and again, we looked at the, um, the opportunity to work with uh, organisms in the water. There's also a lot to be said of using recycled plastics and, and making initiatives that help to support aquatic health because our oceans are one of our largest atmospheric carbon sinks. And there's a lot we can do as builders to reduce plastic proliferation into our oceans. And that actually has a legitimate and meaningful impact on this global carbon cycle. Um, but more directly to the point in terms of the materials we engage with, looking at the process of photosynthesis and the cycling of carbon from the atmosphere into plants, into the soil, and really being willing to extend ourselves to engage into how our materials are produced and where they're produced and support the companies and the industries that are also working within those cycles, particularly um, forestry industries and agricultural industries, we have an incredible opportunity to not just do less harm, but do active good. And so to that end, I, I love that I'm having this conversation with the passive house community because I know that this, this systems thinking, this integrated design process is something that you all are largely familiar with. So on the base level, just looking at the buildings as static, um, you know, static creations, we see that there is this cyclical relationship between the enclosures, the mechanical systems that operate within those enclosures, and the operations and the controls that manage those systems in response to the enclosures as they, you know, uh, try to keep the outside out and the inside in. And we know that this is this is not a lineal. A, you know, a lineal line that is, is a, a, a interdependent relationship of those different facets of a building to achieve energy balance, to achieve our, our design goals. Um, the, those of us that have been practicing uh, the development of those buildings for a while see that those buildings are best realized in an integrated project delivery context. And so the designers and the builders and the owners and operators and all the other stakeholders and sub trades that and consultants that all you know have a hand in these projects they uh when they are working together uh in a organized system that is when you get the best buildings 
built the most efficiently to cost and to budget in the in real world contexts. So it's not just about the product of the building, it's about the process of its design and its development and its long-term operation. And what I'm challenging us as a community to look at is to put the entire building industry and the development of our buildings into the larger socioeconomic, global, ecological system that we're truly operating in and recognize our role within that cycle. And when we do that, we can intervene, as we've been talking about in these ecological systems, that we can either be harming or we could be benefiting by basis of our intention and design. And then incorporating the social structures because justice and equity is a critical component to realize our ecological goals. They cannot be divorced from that. So as we look at the potentials that we have for, for targeting equity and access to technology, the ecological systems that support the materials that we're trying to use to be able to build these great buildings of the future that we, that we seek to design, that is where our true potential lives. And that we as a building industry have, I think, way more leverage and potential than many others do. We have a huge appetite and demand for materials. On an, on an annual basis. And if we can direct that to leverage benefits towards um, you know, rural, land-based, often um, lower economy um, communities that can create the agricultural and forest products that we so desperately need to build these carbon storing, low toxic buildings, that's where we can really start to intervene with the same degree of elegance and efficacy that we realize with our passive house designs to build a really nice building. So I've taken plenty of your time and I've thrown a whole lot of information out there. I'll stop there, um, but I'm happy to stay on and, and field questions and continue the conversation for those of you that are So I, I just wanted to say thank you because that is like seriously inspiring 45 minutes. And what I'd like to suggest is that maybe I'm just going to unmute people and because uh, I think that uh, Jacob would be really happy to have a conversation with everybody. Um, so I'm just going to unmute you. And then if you guys have any questions, just to understand that there's, um, there's, there's, quite a, there's quite a few of you. So now that you will be unmuted, hang on one second. And, and while that's happening, there was one question that came up. Um, and someone is interested in hempcrete, but have been unable to find installers in Ontario. Do I have any suggestions? Um, it's maybe a bit of a cop out. My immediate suggestion is to contact Chris Magwood at the Endeavor Center. You can see his email displayed on the screen right now. I suggest that one, because Chris lives in Ontario. Uh, and two, because Chris literally wrote the book on hempcrete, essential um, hempcrete construction um, in the new, uh, through New Society Publishers. So he would be a great resource. Um, one thing I can say for sure is that there is absolutely a need um, within the building community um, to be able to uh, provide more market ready solutions for more of these uh, these innovative technologies. And so um, I guess I'm not really sure within this audience. I normally uh, have some ability of gauging um, the, the composition of architects versus engineers versus builders. Uh, allied trades, own building operators, et cetera, in my audience. I'm not sure how many of you are builders versus architects. Um, what I will say is this needs to get all the way down to the, to the tradespeople in the field. And so I'm a strong advocate for those of you that are in the building industry uh, to, to get involved. This is not just a design, a design issue. So if, if you guys have any questions for Jacob, you we have unmuted you on our end, and so you just need to unmute yourself and uh, either uh, speak the question or if you would prefer to type, feel free to do that. I needed to be sent. Where was the tendency in this story? Because it's not the man to continue, and they do continue to speak. Hmm. Yeah, hi, Jacob. Uh, this is Rob Blakeney. Hi, thanks for the uh, presentation, and uh, that was a masterclass. Um, I had a question, and I just typed it in, but I'll just say it out loud so that you can guys, um, you know, and this is always going to come up. It's going to come up as our, from from our clients uh, who maybe uh, are, are usually uh, owners uh, or builders who who kind of get it, but obviously uh, we're working within. Uh, budgetary constraints, and so the idea, the question is, um, can the financial business case for natural building be de demonstrated today um, to those kinds of, you know, uh, budget-driven owners and spec builders um, in the absence of any real carbon pr 
pricing in the world in in North America? That is a fantastic question. And uh, yeah, I regret that I don't have any real pricing information built into this presentation. That's uh, saying earlier that that's coming in the next one. But um, I can speak from my uh, from our, my company's experience, my perspective in our company. And just to give background, um, I co-own a design build company, um, a worker on cooperative of uh, I think there's 10 of us now um, uh, in the residential and kind of small commercial um, small multi-unit space. Um, so the quick answer is yes, absolutely. There are market ready, um, cost competitive solutions. Um, they're going to take a variety of different forms depending on the nature of the building. So one immediate example I can give is on this. I was, I referenced this, um, three unit passive house we're building right now. Initially, the spec was for mineral board. Um, as the exterior insulation layer. Um, and we vetted that out both in terms of our value, carbon impact, and cost. We've actually done this on a couple of projects, looking between polyisocyanate foam board, mineral board, and wood fiber board. Um, and I'm not going to say they're all the exact same cost, but what I will say is that um, we were absolutely able to deploy wood fiber board within a cost competitive environment. And this was a commercially funded multi-unit building. So uh, while there was buy-in from all stakeholders and wanting to value low carbon materials, there was not an a, a, you know, exorbitant budget allowance made for that. And some of the ways we were able to realize those savings was built on the fact that that product could also W as a WRB. Um, and so we were able to save a layer there. And it's also tongue and groove installation um, with a very low toxic material profile, which actually made our installation process significantly cheaper. Um, now, there, of course, if you're getting into more custom architecture with uh, very complicated building and closure profiles with really high maintenance and fussy detailing, a lot of the more nat a classic natural building materials like straw, hempcrete, uh, natural plasters, those tend to be very inexpensive from a material standpoint, but, but much more labor driven. And so now you're looking at designs that really optimize the uh, you know, low, low labor inputs to make them cost competitive. And in some cases, they're just not going to get there depending on what you're comparing against. I often find that it's not a question of is the money available, it's where is the money chosen to be allocated. And there's almost always additional uh, value placed in um, other parts of the structure that may not that may be more elective. Um, and that ultimately may come down to the client's choice. Sometimes those folks really want that extra half bathroom just in case their guest happens to wake up in the middle of the night a couple of times a year. Um, there's, you know, there that is. Um, but there were, you know, some of the more low level off the shelf products like replacing fiberglass with dense packed cellulose. Is there a cost increase? Sure. Is that really what's going to make or break the budget on that project? Absolutely not. And not from our experience within our client base. We start moving towards more like production level construction, um, uh, environments, uh, then the numbers can come a little bit closer and those costs matriculate out more heavily over scale. And often a lot of that can be optimized through the, through, through design, um, and, and designing, uh, with some of the, with, you know, efficiencies, uh, built in. That's not universal, but there are always some opportunities to, to realize there. The other thing I wanted to say to answer that in terms of the cost issue, um, this is something that I don't really feel prepared to answer authoritatively, but is absolutely our next focus is I am not convinced that continuing to just increase our insulation levels and dramatically reducing our operational energy profiles is the answer to creating low carbon buildings. And that was revealed in that first slide, that first case study comparison I showed where a code minimum building had a, a lower a lower total carbon profile by 2050 than a high performance um, you know, high uh, carbon insulation, you know, spray foam and, and XPS foam enclosure. And so, and I've done some, you know, recently some modeling of just toggling the air tightness level on some kind of moderately insulated enclosures. And I'm, I feel pretty convinced that we could actually accept a slightly larger energy profile building as we have a decarbonized grid and increasingly efficient um, heating and cooling technology like air source heat pumps as one example. Um, air to water systems are starting to become available as well. Um, so 
as we're getting cleaner grids and as we're getting more efficient operational equipments, I actually hold a little more concern about the material profile than I do about the actual amount of insulation that's reducing those operational heating and cooling loads. So I think there are actually, when you look at that balance and the goal is not just how energy efficient can we make the building, but how low carbon can the building be by a benchmark of time that we're setting? Um, I'm actually feeling more, in, more encouraged that there are some very low cost solutions that may not require R40 walls. We may be okay with R25, R28 walls that simplifies not only the, it's not only lower cost for the installation, but that there's also the trim de detailing, the extension jams and the flashing detailing and all those associated costs that come with those thicker wall assemblies that if we can accept a more moderate level of insulation and realize associated cost savings you know, as they matriculate throughout all those other building enclosure details, if we can then, you know, prioritize a cleaner fuel mix and better mechanical, um, uh, you know, equipment and really prioritize the air tightness, I think, honestly, that's going to be the way that as a larger scale, um, like more industrialized approach to low carbon building will get the cost barrier um, hurdled more quickly. Radical talk to a passive house. Player. I know. Yeah. I'm ready for your slings Tell and arrows. I say this as someone building a passive house right now, but I'm, I'm ready. Let's go there. <laughs> so are there, uh, does anybody have any other questions uh, for our, uh, for Jacob? It's quite suddenly. Have I either okay. offended you all or you all fully understood everything I was saying? <laughs> Or maybe just hungry. Or maybe, yeah, just ready to call it a night. That's also okay. Jason, I would just uh, back up what, what you're saying there as well with the R value uh, of walls is that we're designing now to, you know, uh, climate data, which is outdated. And, um, and you know, th there's a study that was done for Toronto's uh, future weather and climate uh, driver 2040, and um, they're showing that we're going to be dropping um, the amount of um, cool, uh, heating degree days below 18 degrees by about 30 percent in, in the next 15 to 20 years wow. and um, but at the same time of course the um, heat uh, cooling is going to be going up and humid X especially over 30 has increased like 60 70 percent so we're actually going to be by 2040 they're predicting that G the GTA will be climate zone 4a which is kind of like North Carolina Wow so we, we're we're totally different uh, heating cooling regime um anyway so we're designing to a passive house threshold now you based on current climate it, it's not really optimized in my mind that's a great perspective and you know for me when i'm doing system sizing and getting my design heating and cooling loads you know i'm often I mean, all my climate data is 30 year average looking retroactively one thing that I've learned from all of the climate science presentations I've ever attended and reports I've read is that the one thing we can't do is look backwards 30 years and use that as anything of an indicator of what's coming ahead in the next 30. So I think your point is bang on. Um, and for those of us that are, I, and really I think what this gets to the heart of it for me, and I say this, I've been having this, I've been involved in the advisory committee in my state for updating the codes, the energy codes in the state of Vermont. And they unveiled this roadmap of getting to net zero energy by 2050. And I think the, the biggest, I mean, that's a laudable goal, but honestly, we cannot keep looking at energy as a proxy for carbon. We can't. It's not this. It's it's different now. It's different because the climate is different, and what we're designing to is different. As as you just brought up, it's different because the carbon impact of our energy is really different. It's different because the efficiency of our equipment is changing. And so, you know, as we look at the dramatic increase of renewables, both on um, you know individual building scale and and matriculating through our through our grid. Um, I just, I feel like if we're not actually talking about real carbon and not just energy, then we're not really going to understand the impact of our buildings and, w and whether we're hitting true carbon goals. And this is particularly if we're ignoring the entire first phase, which lives in the world of materials. And so if we're using materials to achieve energy goals based on 30-year retroactive bin data, I'm not convinced that that's the most in intelligent or elegant or well-informed way to be designing and building the low-carbon buildings of the 21st century. 
Um, and so I think unpacking a bunch of those assumptions, whether it's retroactive weather data or whether energy, re- you know, operational energy is really the source of our greenhouse gas emissions or, um, you know, any of these other kind of assumptions we've been working at, we really need to quickly unpack those and refactor what our goals are and how we value and, and um, analyze uh, and metric those goals.